text only has so many dimensions to it in terms of how it can be interpreted, whereas speech and voice can have incredible dynamism to it. So I think every language has got something easy, something hard, but it's knowing, it's the knowledge. That's what you need the expert knowledge to do. We're in a boom. And things are really strong at the moment. I mean, sure, there's some pockets of issues still where people have to be on site, etc. But generally, things are really going strong. Now, there are a $7 billion valuation, having just raised another $325 million. So this is obviously very large numbers that we're talking about. And welcome to SlaterPod 67. Hi there. Hey, Florian. So you're just back from the pub? <laughs> Not at 10 a.m. <laughs> Not at 10 a.m.? That's a, no, that's early even for me. So, yeah. No, I haven't really been uh, making too much use of uh, our newfound freedoms of being able to go to the pub and sit outside. But we did go on Monday just for a drink or two. Very good. Yes. Low key. Opening. Keeping it low key still, you know restricting the numbers of groups and things but it's very nice it's nice to be able to see other people out and about yeah same here they opened up uh yesterday pretty big mm. even though some numbers like the uh, covid numbers are going up a little bit but uh yeah also outside restaurants are opening up again and yeah. so generally things are opening up which is great um today we're going to be all uh in on multilingual speech technology and general technology Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to have the CEO and the top science advisor of PaperCup, papercup.com, PaperCup, um, today on as guests. So PaperCup's a, I think we called it in our coverage back in December when they raised uh, like $11 million. We, call, we called them a partially automated dubbing tool, but I think there, mm. there are a lot more. So we'll find out more about that from Jesse and Simon. So it says Jesse, Simon, the CEO, uh, of Paper Cup and Simon King, they uh, brought him on as a really a key science advisor. He's also a professor of speech processing at the University of Edinburgh. Mm. And as we all know, the University of Edinburgh is very strong in language tech. We They, mm. they have a very strong machine translation. Um, I'm not sure, is it a department or a section or um, there as well? Something. Mm. We shall ask him. Today, look, let's talk about the state of the industry. Um, and um, first, also, big tech keeps piling into MT, and then mm. we'll close on speech tech, data laboring, um, gets funded, gets bought and funded. Yeah. yeah. So there's a lot of activity there. Not super in the center of the translation localization industry, but there's just so much going on around the whole theme of speech and, uh, and, and also speech data and natural language processing that I feel it's important for us to talk about it because it will have ripple yeah. effects into into the industry that we uh, talk about. So so tomorrow I'll be presenting, or today, sorry, the day thing. <laughs> today, tomorrow, <laughs> uh, tomorrow, Friday, uh, when you're when you're gonna be listening to this, some of you, at the uh, UAATC's T update. Uh, so there's still some time to register. And um, one e of the UATC. themes- EUATC. E yeah. What did I say? <laughs> UA something, something, something. Sorry. Um, it's all right, it's close uh, enough. EUATC. T update. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, for the early, well, it's going on today. So, well, I guess there's no more time to register. Anyway, moving on. One of the themes that I'll be touching on is kind of that I think things are, I mean, the state of the industry, I think we're, we're in a boom. Mm. Uh, we, we, we're in a boom. Things are really strong at the moment. I mean, sure, there's some pockets of um, issues still where people have to be on site, etc. But generally, things are really going strong. If you look you at think that, this is like the kind of post-war era where things kind of kicking off after a really rough time. Well, a lot of like these macro commentators talk about like the return of the roaring twenties, and um, yeah. and you know, let's. You, I guess you can pick up on that theme. Uh, when you just narrow it down to the to the language industry, you know you see that some of the super agencies are are doing really well, posting good results. Um, you know we're also getting anecdotal feedback from staff that people at LSPs are really busy, right? Mm. 
So, yeah, I mean, so yes. it's, it's, it's definitely interesting. I, I mean, one thing I was saying when, uh, when we were saying, oh, yeah, people are really busy. I was like, yeah, people are always really busy. But I mean, I guess this is like never before, I think, was some of the <laughs> some of the words that we heard from project managers. So it's, it does really, really seem to be um, the case. And also, I mean, one thing I was going to say is that uh, there's a lot of hiring happening, as we saw from from the job index, which stands to reason if companies and people are super busy, you need to be, you know, staffing up, saving the people you've got already, but also obviously planning for 2021 and, and hopefully, well, the boom that we were sort of expecting to come. Yeah, I mean, the last one we published was uh, as, at a record high, right? I mean, the baseline yeah. was, when was it? Sometime in April, in the July August, I think it was August, that, July 2018. Yeah, so it's been like okay, a year, was, over over a year and a half now of, of tracking this. Uh, even more, yeah. So basically, initially it went up, 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 then COVID hit, then fell off a cliff, and uh, uh, now it's back at 132, and it started off at 100. So th- yeah, there's there's a lot of strength in the job market for, for the language mm-hmm. industry. And also when you track uh, some of the publicly listed companies, uh, you know, RWS is a great indicator because they're so broad. And now with SDL, they basically cover the entire industry, almost like every mm-hmm. facet of it. Um, and so it's soon close again on all time highs. I mean, that's driven by kind of the macro push on on the share mo- uh, stock market generally. But I, I also think that, you know, investors tend to have a bit of information. So they, I think they haven't doing reported well. yet, have they? For- no for the end or well it would be their q1 i think to the end of december 2020 actually i think they only do it on a six month basis i might be wrong they do yeah they're not they're okay. not quarterly yeah and there's also a lot of deal activity a lot of buying and selling and funding and interest going on out there so um so generally i think that the industry is, is has had a fantastic q1 and is heading into a an even better q2 uh, second mm. quarter so Look, a lot of this, and you know, we're not here to make a kind of macroeconomic commentary, but there is this super loose monetary policy where like these central banks are just printing, you know, ungodly amounts of money and which then filters into the system. And it really, I mean, you could argue like it filters all the way down to 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 this industry. So you see a lot of funding going on, but generally, of course, just things are so, so busy. I follow a, um, or, or, or uh, yeah, they're very busy. I follow a couple of supply chain people on Twitter, and some of them are yeah. saying like they're hearing from their um, from their supply uh, from their um, uh, yeah suppliers in 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 China that like the wait times at the ports are are starting to really ramp up, and people you know are charging higher fees for getting things out of uh, of China and delivered to the states, etc. So it's mm. it's all kind of signs that. Some of the remaining COVID restrictions, combined with with really that kind of unprecedented monetary policy, is really heating up up things. Yeah. Generally, the economy. And now, would you just say, right, the pub? I mean, things are opening up, so this is going to be a crazy summer. <laughs> yeah, when things are I completely think open. I think things are opening up, and I think you know people are already starting at least here to book holidays speculatively, almost for for later in the year, summer, etc. I, I got an invite to a wedding in the U.S. in in September, so you know I think people really are expecting things to open up I think also there's 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 the extent to which maybe companies started well definitely looked at their budgets and looked at the outlook for 2021 and then unlocked you know potentially budgets that had been frozen for Hmm. last year 2020 so for the for the localization uh, translation language industry I mean what this means is kind of you have these segments that were super strong already kind of the software as a service the enterprise it the life sciences and now mm. all these other areas are coming back as well the travel you know the maybe bricks and mortar retail all, all these kind of e-commerce things um are really well e-commerce was strong as well throughout the pandemic but like all these mm. weaker sectors are now really coming back as well so uh it's gonna look uh, it's gonna be there's a, probably quite a, quite a lot of market year. i would say there's probably quite a lot of marketing going on if you think people hmm. are, you know, starting I, like the brick and mortar stuff, the travel stuff, you know, if you are aware that people are starting to book holidays or starting to go into shops, they're going to be advertising sales. They're going to be, you know, making sure you book your package holiday with with them rather than rather than somebody else. So, yeah, potential Absolutely. growth in, in that sector as well. Trying to make some money back. Yeah. Uh, moving on to uh, big tech, we sp- speak about big tech a lot because they're piling into MT and more and more is happening. So we just uh, had in our sweep service that NVIDIA, the giant chip company, they have a, they're kind of building 
um, their own, well, AI stack. Like you have Microsoft, mm. Amazon, Google, they all have these big IBM, uh, offerings yeah. of artificial intelligence offerings, which of course includes machine translation. And now NVIDIA also, uh, we came across something they, they launched, uh, I think it's been around for a while, Jarvis. So it's their offering for lack of a better word. And, and it, it includes like speech recognition, controllable speech to text and real time MT. So mm. just heads up, there's another major player moving in here that that uh, that is really offering MT as part of their core. Uh, and, you know, NVIDIA is a monster. I mean, they're like, they have like a 400 billion market mm. cap. Of course, this is not because of the AI. This is all because they're basically doing the chips that the AI runs on, right? So they're the... Mm. One so of this the, is like, will be like off the shelf, uh, generic kind of MT rather yeah. than any bespoke service or anything. That's right. Yeah, so far. It looked quite basic when I looked at it, like mm -hmm. the, 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 the examples, the language coverage, but you never know, right? If you have these giant companies coming in, um, you know, yeah. depending on how they want to build it out. And then there's another <laughs> funny story, Logitech, I think Swiss, US-based hardware manufacturer, they partner with Baidu Brain, and they, let me read this, the mouse, they, they, they launched a mouse that does MT. <laughs> so the mouse features a voice button just below the scrolling wheel, and after pressing <laughs> uh, the button, users can dictate text, and the mouse will translate it by using speech recognition tech. Uh, and... Okay. Obviously MT. But the software is on is in the mouse or the software's like no. The software's can't be, right? No, I mean this, the the mouse knows? just picks it's it everywhere. up. <laughs> the mouse is like a mic. Yeah, it's like I, I a microphone know. or yeah, like yeah, a button. Seem, yeah. Seem, seem, seems like a gimmick, but uh, uh another you know, Baidu, right? Baidu brain, Google brain. So it's uh, it's just another uh, big tech company chasing <laughs> this. Cool. Uh, then there was another company we had on our radar, but slowly letting it go because they're getting too big and too diverse. Uh, mm. What was that about? Also a funding yeah. there. Well, I think originally, I don't know if they're still called Scale AI or if they're just called Scale now, but uh, scale. a company called Scale. Scale? Yeah. Um, they bought the we dot com. Oh, they bought Scale. Okay, nice. Very good. Nice. They, yeah. Um, yeah, we covered them a while ago, I think. Like you said, when they first became a unicorn, a billion dollar company, I think, a couple of year or year and a half ago or something. I mean, now they're at a seven billion dollar valuation and having just raised another three hundred and twenty five million. So this is obviously very large numbers that we're talking about. Um so they've doubled as of this new funding round, they doubled their valuation um in just a four month time horizon. Um, and yeah, they're planning to increase the hiring, expand product offerings, everything you might imagine if you just got a massive injection of cash. Hmm. Interesting company. Uh, you know, we spend a little bit of time on their, on their website and it's, um, yeah, as you said, the valuations are getting crazy. Um, so they, they offer this really broad, um, data annotation capability. Mm. I mean, and um, and we we did run the report. You know, please go back and and look at the coverage of what we did there. It's something that LSPs are getting into. So they're basically kind of the 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 most well funded data annotator now in the world. They're not only tech, but their tech is obviously super sophisticated and and getting better with these types of uh, you know amounts of capital at their disposal. Mm. And when you go to the website, natural language processing or, or, or language data um, annotation is, is a core part. They do image, video, some other things I don't understand, and then uh, and then text and document. And a, and a part of this is even if you scroll deeply into the website, it is machine translation. So they they also mm. um, they also offer it. It does seem the DMT part a little too a little generic. So you you kind of you feel that it's not something they're focusing on just yet. But um, yeah, but yeah it's it, it's something that's on their radar. And if they have enough, uh, if they feel that there's a, a big enough market, you know, they they can focus in on that. It seems uh, like they maybe build it right rather than like they build you an engine and then off you go. Is that is that how you sort of understand their machine translation? No, I think it, I, I think I it's know. more. Uh, I think it's very much focused towards kind of the dialogue generation, speech to text, text to speech. So probably more for okay. kind of the customer service. It's not like for in, like enterprise right. complex text um, uses, right? It seems like this is very much more mm -hmm. towards the, yeah, the the conversational MT. And that's also how they kind of Got market it. it when you, it's like you, you record yourself, speak first. It's the, 
it's the basic conversational MT, but still mm -hmm. still in integrated. So look, why why do we bring this up? I mean, a as we said, if they go into MT in a big way, uh, it could be it could be interesting having such a powerful company go into it. And and second, um, you know, there is there's maybe a potential for working together with them uh, if you have like a large data set. Um, you know, yeah. maybe look and maybe there there's someone you want to talk to. So generally like check selling, out their web like an LSP selling their data set to to these guys anonymized who knows right. yeah Might just something to be to keep an eye on I mean a mm. big well-funded company moving really really quickly I mean raising these two rounds in like you know a couple of months back to back is interesting mm. so check out the website mm. skill.com interesting and then finally um and since this is the speech um the speech part <laughs> so Microsoft <laughs> just announced we're buying re nuance. we're rebranding Speech pod, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Microsoft just announced they're buying Nuance. This is a yeah, a speech basically a speech technology firm for like twenty billion dollars, nineteen billion dollars, nineteen seven billion. It's huge. Billion. I know. I was so I was so shocked when I saw this. I was like, really for speech? You know, it seems so arbitrary. I guess, but it's it's definitely not clearly. I mean, it's yeah, it's uh, it's the second largest acquisition that Microsoft's done since LinkedIn, apparently. What I read, so mm. Nuance owns the Dragon, uh, I don't know, Dragon suit of software. I actually knew some translators ten, 10 plus years ago that used it to dictate translation. We had like a trial back at CLS where uh, probably ten or fifteen translators tested speech input and whether it gave a productivity boost. I think it was, mm. uh, it was. It did, but it was hard for people that that are so that are that prefer to basically type, right? I mean, it's a it's a preference yeah. issue if, thing if you want to talk into a mic. Um, yeah, so a lot of people say this acquisition is mostly kind of around U.S. healthcare, but I definitely think it can be a lot broader. And um, yeah, interesting. So so much happening in the whole space of language technology that voice everything voice. Well, i mean we just ran that that article didn't we about apple hiring a ton of like voice specialists for Absolutely. their probably for siri but for whatever else they want to use it for as well yeah and maybe for uh machine dubbing so let's go to jesse and simon and learn more about the latest state of the art in all things speech and technology and language and translation Cheers. And welcome back to Slater Pod. Today with uh, Paper Cup CEO Jesse Shemin and Paper Cup Science Advisor and Professor of Speech Processing in University of Edinburgh, Simon King. Hi, Simon. Hi, Jesse. Hello. Hello, hello. Hi. Thanks Hi so both. much. Welcome. <laughs> Yes, sir. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to uh, join SlaterPod today. So um, very excited to talk to you. We had a bit of a an attempt previously in the previous segment of this podcast to parse through some of the recent news in the um, in the speech space. You know, you had Nuance getting acquired, etc. But uh, uh, you guys are a lot closer uh, to this. So uh, Paper Cup, uh, you know, synthetic voices to make videos available in any language. So we're really excited to talk to you about this today. But uh, I guess. Uh, uh, Jesse, you're probably a lot better than giving the uh, at giving the elevator pitch than me. So tell us a bit more about Paper Cup. Uh, yeah, sure, happy to. So what what we do is we want to make the world's video and audio consumable in any language, and we're doing that by creating synthetic voices in target languages that reflect the type of person speaking in the original order of video. So if you think about the most basic form, if there's a Sky News clip on how London is cloudy today. So that'll be a clip that's uploaded every day. Um, if that's in English and uploaded and distributed on YouTube, we can take that same clip and translate it with synthetic voice into Spanish so that people in the Spanish speaking population can actually watch that content. And the idea is we want to apply that to across all languages and across any form of audio and video content. That's the dream. Got it. Got it. So, so tell us a bit more about the team. Uh, you know, where, where you guys based? Uh, what's been some of the kind of history trajectory of the company so far? 
Got it. Yeah, people always are uh, are surprised to hear that we do not make physical paper cups or paper pa or paper paper cups. Um, this is the original logo. If you can actually see it, it's two tin cans. It's the most elementary form of communication. The idea being that we want to facilitate dialogue and conversation and allow consumption of content and media, no matter what language somebody speaks. And that's always the premise behind what we're doing. But the premise was we saw that there was basically billions of hours of content that stuck in a single language. Because when you think about when any form of video or audio is produced, to justify recreating that in another language is usually quite expensive, it's laborious, it's complex. And so we realized that that can't just be solved by humans and that technology would be a fundamental player. And so what we wanted to do is basically use synthetic speech to allow, again, the, any form of content to be consumed in any language. That's where we started out. Um, and so we started the company um, a few years back, I mean, a little over three years ago, um, co-founded with my partner, Jamong, who studied speech at Cambridge and did a master's um, in speech processing. And we are now a team of around 20 people, primarily based in London, uh, filled mm -hmm. with people that are studied machine learning, as well as software engineers and people on the customer and commercial side. Wow. So Simon, you're not based in London, right? No, I'm I'm in... I'm in Edinburgh. I'm at the University of Edinburgh. That's my real job. Uh, my fun <laughs> job real... is helping paper cup. Yeah. The fun job is helping paper cup. So so tell us a bit more about uh, your background on the uh, and, and um, speech processing side, University of Edinburgh. It's a very kind of renowned center for AI in in language, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Edinburgh always says one of the largest groups in in that large area of kind of language processing so that would include machine translation um, speech recognition so transcription and then what i do which is speech synthesis you know, speech generation from text and then all the other kind of areas of natural language processing that surround that so you know, we've got like, over a hundred people researching those areas in edinburgh all wow. told um plus you know lots and lots of phd students we run specialist masters programs uh, and, and all of that um and we've been yeah developing this speech synthesis technology since I think my group started in 1984. I've been there since 1993, and I've stuck it out long enough to become the director of the group. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So a lot, a lot must have happened obviously since then. And we'll we'll go into into the details there. And uh, well, good for you, Chessie, to uh, you know get someone as accomplished from the academic side as Simon and the research side to to join you. It's uh, probably validation for the business uh, relatively early on in the life of the business yeah so uh, tell us maybe we can start because it's a complex discussion right and we're trying to bring this uh, a little bit closer uh, to the people that are in the broader translation localization industry maybe just tell us a bit more about like how the underlying technology is is built like there's so many of these components now kind of available off the shelf from amazon google and we we talked about uh, on the previous podcast from even other kind of big tech companies so what it is you buy what it is you build you know mm. not, not to give away the secret sauce but just just go a little bit into the tech here yeah so the the core components you think if you take an original file um let's take um again let's just say that sports commentary on the nba my favorite topic if you have a video that's written in english we take that file we pump it through our pipeline and that basically has three fundamental technologies the first is what's called um speech recognition which is taking the audio from the actual video file and converting it into text. So in this case, English audio into English text. Then we use machine translation systems to translate that original text from English into, say, Spanish or German. And then we use our own speech synthesis system to actually generate the voice based off of that, off of that translated text. Now, you're right to say that these technologies, we haven't invented certainly the first two, uh, well, we haven't invented either of these steps. but the first two we typically do outsource because those are big problems that big tech giants and other companies are trying to solve for, the transcription and translation. And then we use our own text-to-speech system to actually generate the synthetic voices. So I think part, a big part of the paper cup product is A, piecing together the pipeline um, of that end-to-end -end pipeline and the complexity that's involved in that, as well as more specifically the text-to-speech system, which is the last leg of that pipeline, which is more bespoke to us. It's very interesting. So the text to speech, and we're probably going to talk about this later on, like the emotional component, that's really kind of the last, well, mile or whatever that you, that you customize. That's the critical component in that. 
It, yeah, in my mind, and to me, and obviously I'm, I'm biased, but I, I also find it the most interesting because within like text is not that it's rudimentary, but but text only has so many dimensions to it in terms of how it can be interpreted. Whereas speech and voice has in, can have incredible dynamism to it, and there are so many different contours and manifestations of how you can actually vocalize even a single word or sentence. And it's so interesting to think mm -hmm. about how to create that appropriate voice in any language. And we don't, there's no bulletproof answer. It's, it's an incredibly challenging problem. That's why I think it's, that's why I think it's though really interesting. I mean, I, I guess yeah. another way to think about it is that the, the, the synthesis needs to be sort of bespoke to this particular use case. Whereas the transcription, it just needs to work. You know, you just need to transcribe the words correctly. And once it's done that, there's kind of nothing much left to improve there. And that's what kind of is good to buy in and and so on. But the synthesis needs to be tailored, you know, need to be controllable, needs to have the speaker identity appropriate to the picture and, and all of those things. So that's why you would want to make the synthetic voice part um, before you try to make the other parts. They can be very general purpose, mm. I think. And just one quick, quick yeah. follow up on that. The, the translation step here, the machine translation step, since you're, I guess, at this point in time, kind of focused on the conversational side of things, right? Or the presentation of it. Is, is the machine translation a major issue for you at this point? Or is it more kind of transcription level where, well, at some point, it's just going to be a somewhat accurate translation? Mm. Well, well the, other, the errors do propagate. Right, because we're dealing with with three systems here. So, if you have poor transcription, then your machine translation might talk about a completely different topic, which I don't think a customer would be thrilled with. Which is also why we've built it, what's called a human in the loop system that allows us to actually quality check the videos before they're generated and the translation, because you can't rely on the equivalent of a Google Translate, maybe to get around the corner to a coffee shop, but for topics on like coronavirus, it's it's obviously not reliable. So, you are right to point out that. We also are victim or 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 are hinged to the progress and the quality that the transcription translation providers can actually generate. That being said, they've obviously made progress over the years, and they are certainly far better positioned to try and solve the final percentage points of optimization and accuracy than we are. So we don't even try and solve those. Hmm. Hmm. I think it's really interesting to hear about, on the one hand, these kind of foundational underlying technologies, which are kind of available for anybody really to to use and and build upon like the ASR and machine translation and, and text to speech but and also then to hear a little bit about how you build on top of it and develop those workflows i'm just wondering once once you've kind of got this you know human in the loop you've got the process and the tech down uh, i mean how do you go about you know patenting that protecting it from well from the outside i, I suppose what is it that you can uh, begin to patent once you've come up with that. So, so just to well, just part of that. I think, I think, and Simon, I'm curious what you think. But from my perspective, ASR and machine translation have matured to a degree where there have been a lot of commercial applications that have exploited that mm. to a reasonable degree. So, for example, take ASR. You have things like Otter and some of these other tools that take transcription notes on Zoom calls. And machine translation, you have a bunch of providers like. Rev.com or Unable that are these human loop models that have make document or website or customer support translation dead simple. I think when it comes to text to speech, it's still relatively early to compared to those technologies in terms of their commercial exploitation. Not mm -hmm. because there isn't a market to pursue, but because the quality of text to speech only recently hit this naturalness level such that it would, could be more widely consumed across different forms of use cases, whether that's an article reader or for audiobooks or whatever it might be. So I still think that there's not only an there's still a large amount of technical progress and change that needs to be made in the world of text to speech. And as a result of that, the commercial applications are still incredibly early in terms of how speech can actually be exploited. Mm. Um, Sam, just before I answer the patent question, Sam, do you, do you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you certainly timed the founding of the company perfectly in terms of that quality jump in, in, in synthesis. We look back over, you know, my, his, my career in synthesis, you pass various milestones. There's one, you know, quite a while ago now where we could say it was as intelligible as, as human speech. Now, and that was a major, major event when that happened. Before that, it was less intelligible. So that was kind of got solved. 
And then quite a lot of time later, we can, we can almost say that naturalness is solved in the sense that sometimes people have an equal preference for the natural speech and the synthetic speech under, under some circumstances. Mm. And so now we've moved on from solving the basics into what do you really want to do with the synthetic speech? Like, do you want to make it expressive? Do you want to make it sound like a particular person and all those things? Um, and mm. to, to, to lead into what Jesse's, I'm sure Jesse can, can try and patent and protect all sorts of things, but there's actually quite a lot of craft in, in making it. And the technology is kind of available in the open literature and the code is even, even indeed available. Yeah. Um, pretty much anyone can have a go at it, but really there's quite a lot of craft to, to mm. get the most out of it. Like having the right data behind it, which is proprietary to the company. Um, having people who really care about detail and spend a lot of time listening to it and, and, and so on. And that's not patentable stuff. That's know-how rather than mm -hmm. patent. Um, I, th I, I think that's very true. I think also patents are often, unless, unless you are a tech giant, patents are often overstated or assign more value than they probably should be mm. at such an early stage. I think it, it feels like, and I'm not suggesting that, that we shouldn't file or pursue them, but it feels more of like a hygiene factor that people like waving around rather than something that has practical value, unless you have an army of lawyers that can defend and litigate, which is just not the interest of a startup because there are a few things that you can do and focus on. And one of them is usually not going to court and you want to, if anything, stay out and just yeah, build a product that. that people want. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a good point. Uh, I think it's a good way or interesting way to think about patents as well. Um, maybe Simon, if you can expand a bit more, you talked about some of the some of the developments in text to speech, um, but perhaps in your time, how have you seen it evolve? You know, perhaps in the last ten years, five years, or even just the last few months, what what's changed? Yeah, in a way, I mean, the 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 problem has always been the same. The goals kind of always been the same, which is which is nice. Um, I say we, it, it was a question of kind of crossing various milestones. Obviously, what, what's the first thing you want? You want to be able to understand what this machine is saying, right? And so it, for a long, long time, intelligibility was a problem. And then that, that got kind of solved. Um, and ever since then, um, we've been in a paradigm where it's, it's machi a machine learning paradigm. So always... Almost, almost since the very beginning, since the 70s, let's say, speech synthesis has involved taking data, taking recordings, mm -hmm. usually of one person, lots of them. So, Esther, if you want to you want to make a synthetic voice of you, we'll just go and harvest no. all of these podcasts, <laughs> right? You've got beautiful audio yeah. quality there, this lovely microphone. So we'll just go and chop out all that audio and get the transcriptions and probably, probably hundreds of hours there, right, across these, yeah. the history of this podcast. That's easily enough to make a really spectacularly good quality voice. It's always been based on data. Yeah. Always good data in the studio and so on. And it's just really what's changed has been the use of kind of deep learning neural mm. networks. That's that's the latest innovation. But that, mm. that wasn't as in, in, internally inside the field, that wasn't an enormous paradigm shift because we were before that we were just using some other sorts of machine learning and before that some other sorts of machine learning. Mm. For, for, for us, it's just it's just the latest sort of machine learning. And um, yep. Let's do this again in ten years and, and and laugh at those neural networks we were using and say, oh, what, what, what an old model that was. Now we're using something else. Something else. So yeah. it's just a model. Would, um, would you would you say, Simon, that there's that there's been bigger leaps in progress over the past call it two to five years relative to what it was like five to ten years ago? And is there more attention paid to text to speech now? I mean, I wouldn't say bigger leaps. It's been steadily getting better. I think what it is, I think of these sort of milestones that cross this threshold. I mean, mm. with compare it to say something like speech transcription, um, that crossed various thresholds, right? There was a time when it was so bad, you wouldn't use it for anything. And then it mm. crossed the kind of, if I'm in a quiet office and I'm a really bad typist, I'm, it's now good enough to dictate a letter. And it's cross, it just crosses the threshold. And then it crosses the, I'm willing to have subtitles made on YouTube for it. And then, you mm. know, it crosses these usability thresholds. Uh, and that's not because suddenly the error rate halves. It's just it's been steadily going down, this error rate, and it happens to cross some threshold where it makes a certain product viable yeah. or not viable. And I think synthesis is the same. It's been steadily getting better and it's sort of suddenly kind of hit this acceptance. Um, and at the same time, maybe people's acceptance changes as well, right? Because we're so used to listening to quite cruddy audio on Zoom calls and yeah. Skype and all the rest of it, probably quite tolerant of some of the nastinesses in speech synthesis. Well, it just, I think it, it's, it, it's okay, you know. 
I think it, you make a really good point about the sort of acceptance and adoption. I, I remember a couple of years ago um, at one of our uh, SlaterCon co- uh, events, we had uh, speakers on stage from media localization, so from sort of entertainment companies. And, and one of them was talking about the use of synthetic voices um, for uh, blind audiences. So the use of, uh, and saying that actually it was quite, quite well adopted, quite well uh, accepted even. Uh, and I guess that's more so, or at least I think she was talking more so about the, the UK predominantly. Um, but I wonder, yeah, to what extent it's now fully or somewhat accepted. And also what, what are you doing or how do you go about removing some of those hurdles for acceptance? Is it a technical thing or is it sort of a, um, an education thing almost? Um, I mean, in the case of people, you know, people who are visually impaired, like, you know, blind computer programmers, if you've ever, ever met one, you'll be unbelievably impressed that they can write computer code without seeing anything on the screen. Um, for, for someone like that, because they're very highly motivated and they probably don't care about naturalness, they care an awful lot about um, speaking rate because that's the bottleneck. Speaking is slower than reading. Um, mm-hmm. And so they've always been willing to learn to use, so they're willing to adapt to quite bad speech synthesis for screen readers because it achieves a very important goal for them. So their acceptance level is in a completely different place to yep. to someone who's listening to an audiobook for pleasure. Um, so synthesis crossed that threshold a long, long time ago. The moment it was mm. even at all understandable, people said, right, I'll use that. Um, whereas nobody was listening to audiobooks with this 1980s speech synthesis. That would be, you know, fatiguing to say the least. So yeah, you, you're right. I think people have to kind of, people might move their thresholds around over time as well. Um and people's and sort got, of quality got, threshold might might actually they might lower it, yeah, because mm. they realise that oh now it opens up all of this stuff. If I'm just willing to listen to slightly less good audio, suddenly now I can do all these things. You know, I actually think I actually think it's a big education piece that we have to embark on because the alter the substituting alternative is always human voice, right? And so that's where the expectation lies. Synthetic voice, especially in its current form today, will always consist can not always, but will consistently underperform whatever the, the whatever the expressivity and the um, type of voice you can use for with natural humans. And I think part of what we have to do is explain to people, yes, you are right, there's a differential, but the question is not whether or not there's a difference. The question is whether or not that difference will be accepted. And I think mm-hmm. oftentimes you're surprised that people actually will accept a lower quality voice and that what you have to do is actually just trial and test it and see what the sort of engagement and retention looks like. Mm. Yeah, and that probably varies hugely with different markets. I mean, I'm sure Jesse mm-hmm. Paper Cup sorry already found that. Some some people some markets just like, no, not interested. And others say, Yeah, bring it on. Mm. And and it's, I I don't have a good model of that other than to try it and see. Yeah. Well, that's what the startup is for. So yeah. to uh to bring it maybe just back to the language um uh, kind of translation component again. You, you, Simon, you mentioned that there's probably hundreds of hours. No, there is hundreds of hours of, of Esther's um, a voice on on YouTube. So is and mine, yours. right? But, <laughs> yeah. But there is there is zero hours of me speaking my native language German on YouTube. So if you if you took my accented English and and basically uh, ran your models and then had it uh, obviously had basically the voiced and speaking German. Has that been tried? Like, is that even close? Oh, absolutely. To, like, yeah. I mean, I mean, that's kind of that's one of the sort of USPs of, of Paper Cup is that that's what they would aspire to do. They, they would, at the moment, maybe the claim will be we'll get someone that sounds appropriate for what you look look like. It goes, you know, because <laughs> this person watching the dubbing video doesn't really know what the real you sounds like, perhaps. So it's yeah. you uh, that yeah. cares. Mo- it's you that cares most that it's appropriate. It might not be a perfect match, but yeah, absolutely. This idea of personalizing synthesis has been, I mean, for my group, a very long standing interest. I mean, uh, the most recent spin out from my group, which is not, Paper Cup's not from my group, I mean, he's actually making voices for people who can't speak or are going to lose their voice because, for example, they have motor neuron disease. And, and in that case, again, you want you kind of personalizing it to them. That's within languages. But the same techniques work across languages. It's really kind of, we just try and kind of, I hate the word voice print, but that kind of captures it for most people is that we can distill your voice down into, you know, some numbers and yeah. these numbers when fed into the synthesizer will make it sound like you it's just going to be some you know hundreds of numbers and for Esther there'll be a different set of numbers and we feed those numbers in and it'll sound like her into essentially the same system mm. so the system just, the one it's, model it's can a, generate many voices yeah. mm. 
Yeah, just that that particular setup with hundreds of uh, hours in in a in a in someone's non-native language, and then and trying to re-engineer it uh, into that person's native language would be a nice test because then you could like. Yeah, really compare. Because and if, I was going to say the me... same for me. Almost. I mean, kind of the reverse. But I speak French. But I don't. There's no not natively, but I do speak it. So I wonder what my you know French persona would would sound like in using <laughs> your models. Well, yeah. so, so, some, something that's interesting is that because this is still uncharted territory, and what you do see is still a lot of experimentation and testing and just seeing what people respond to. There is no mm. right answer of what you mm. should sound like in an alternative language. Yeah. And I, 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 yeah, I don't think that's necessarily been solved. What's interesting is how in the, in the dubbing industry, how, because we've spoken to a ton of agencies and voice artists, how they'll try to mimic certain aspects of the original actor in the original film or TV show. Mm. Though it's, you, you can't just assume that it should be that distinct voice in the target language, but instead, at least at this point, it's getting something that's comparable and similar to it. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I think maybe let's take a, a step back from from understanding all of uh, or trying to understand all of the tech um, and think a bit about the the market um, and the customer mm. segments here. So, I think some of the use cases and some of the customers you're talking out about um, is. Uh, sort of solo YouTubers, and it goes right, in terms of the potential use cases, you've got right from one YouTuber, a couple of hundred views, you've got things like corporate education videos, some maybe unscripted content. And then, you know, when we're thinking about audiovisual content, it goes right the way up to these sort of premium Hollywood productions, you know, maybe uh, some of the high level dramas as well. Um, I mean, how do you view that kind of continuum of of customers or, or, or video use cases, whatever you want to call it, how do you think about that, and how do you see that adoption curve? So I I think it's first of all it's it's exciting because it's all untapped, and that's why I think there are going to be a bunch of successful startups and companies in the field of mm. speech because it's still so underexploited today. So I, you're right that there's a continuum. In, that's for video content, but equally for all other forms of text-to-speech applications. Again, even article readers or um, who knows voiceovers for, like we said, audiobooks or any of these or call center automation mm. systems. Like there are so many different applications to pursue, which is why I think it's the companies that will be successful are the ones that figure out the combination of of product as well as text-to-speech engine that underpins it. Because um, this isn't just a function of building great voices. You need that as a bare minimum, as a prerequisite for whatever you're building. But there also needs to be a functional use case that you're actually solving for, and the product needs to appeal to that. So I think there's a spectrum within content that's really interesting. And you're right. It starts off with probably your semi-professional solo YouTuber who's uploading tech reviews of smartphones just as a side hobby all the way to studios. And each of them will have a different set of requirements, not only in terms of voice quality and uh, the level of expression that you're able to add, but equally in terms of number types of languages and accents and dialects. So the way in which you actually look at that spectrum is what do people need? What do they want? What are they asking for? And that's how you can figure out which use case you can target depending upon what you're actually able to offer at that moment in time. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and is there, I mean, have you defined that for, for Paper Cup yet? Is there a sort of a segment where you're seeing quite a bit of traction? That's part of the difficulty, to be honest. It's that mm. you do see just varying demand from a ton of different types of use cases. And it's our job to make sure, especially my job, to make sure that we're focused and being more exclusive to some or the other. And part of the exercise that we're actually undertaking now, are which ones do we think yeah, which ones do we want to be solely focused on because we're getting pulled in a lot of different directions? Hmm. Um, certainly, we want to stay within the world of, of video content. And I would say we're not, I think focusing on the studio side of things is probably still too ambitious relative to what top performing voice actors do. And I still, to be honest, I still think Stranger Things will be exclusive to humans for probably forever. And I, and I think that's right, right? And I think the top performing titles that require a, a genuine performance will still be exclusive to humans. And it's, I don't think we're trying to replace that by any sense. Um, so I think we're probably on the earlier side of the spectrum for lack of a better way of describing it. 
Yeah, it's so interesting when you're saying it uh, kind of get pulled in all different directions. It's it's because it's so early and then you really, yeah, you need to define the market you're really playing in. Um, very, very interesting. And and also when you're saying um, that like the big studio productions are probably going to be the the domain of like actual like voice actors for 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 the foreseeable time that's also interesting because we we're, we're getting a lot of people asking us about this like w- what's your take on it and it's great to have an expert take <laughs> because there's a lot of physical infrastructure in the dubbing world right a lot of studios and things like that that uh, that are assets on companies balance sheets so so to me what's most enticing is not what is dubbed today but what is not translated or dubbed or localized because okay. of the, the traditional sort of infrastructure and process can accommodate for it. To me, that's what's mm, most yeah. exciting. I, I, yeah, it, we're not in this game to try and replace the dubbing industry. To, I'm fine with it existing by all means, but there are literally billions of hours of content that are untouched because they can't necessarily afford the traditional method of localizing. That to me yeah. is what's is what's most exciting. Got it. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, just a brief technical question again. Like, what is hard about extending your product into more and more languages? Is this kind of easy? Okay, let's go. I don't know, Hindi. Let's do Japanese. Let's Chinese. Or is this like a major project with you know milestones, etc.? Um, Simon's probably better positioned to answer that. It'll often come down to data, but uh, also, yeah, the proximity of languages to one another also will probably dictate how difficult it can be to train on those. But Simon, I'm curious what, what you think. Yeah, I mean, this, uh, you know, this is a journey that every text-to-speech company that, that there ever was has has taken. I think probably not one of them has set out to do one language only. They always have, and then we'll add one and we'll add one, and it's a question of how you add them. Yeah, it takes two things. It takes data and it takes some language expertise. Um, it doesn't mean you need to be a native speaker, though. Um, but you need some some linguistic knowledge or expertise of how this language behaves and how it's different or similar to, to other ones. If you think about you know problems like how do you turn spellings into pronunciations? English is a mess. You need a dictionary is the only answer. Um, Spanish is essentially rule-based. Um, once you know the rules, you're done. Other writing systems have their own idiosyncrasies and so on. So you need, you need this linguistic expertise and that's you know that's it. those are experts. Those are the sort of people that you know do the master's program in, in Cambridge or in Edinburgh. Mm-hmm. Um, so you need someone with that that skill. So to scale across languages often involves hiring a person with with some knowledge of that language, or having a team that's got it between it, and then going off and getting the data. The primary data, of course, is you know recordings of a native speaker in that language, you know, mm-hmm. in a studio to sufficient quality of you know the the tens or hundreds of hours that you need, and then. Unfortunately, that essentially repeats for each language. There's a sort of fixed cost there. You can't yeah, okay. you can't get away with not having that recorded speech, and you have to have that you know that linguistic processor, the thing that deals with all the mess of text and turns it into pronunciations, and that's you know repeated for each language. I mean, the actual sort of software code and the the methods and the models they're the same everywhere, but mm. you just have to kind of you know it's a cookie cutter. You have to kind of like now let's do the one for Hindi, now let's do the one for and work it work it through in that way and there's a fi- there's a fixed substantial cost to each language Simon would you are there any languages that have historically been particularly painful for researchers in, in, in TTS I think they all they all I mean this, this is a kind of classic <laughs> kind of, of linguistics question is it which language is the hardest in the world which language is the easiest in the world and there's no they're, 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 all, they're all equally easy for babies to learn so that's you know <laughs> all, all the whole languages are trivial to learn as a native speaker right we're all evidence of that um, but no, they, they just, it's, it's more that each language has something that gets you, um, mm. something that's easy, something that's hard, you know, let's, let's say take Finnish, um, Finnish, the word is not a very well-defined idea. You know, you, you think German could have long words. No, forget it. Finnish, <laughs> they, they can just be whole sentences. So the more, that's just completely different to other languages, but mm. then the pronunciation is kind of straightforward. Um, the Japanese, you know, they've got three different alphabets and complicated stuff going on with the writing system but the pronunciation is trivial it's the same phonemes the same sounds of language as, as spanish actually mm. <laughs> they're almost exactly wow. the same so everything every language has got something easy something hard but it's knowing it's the knowledge that's the that's you know that's what you need the expert knowledge to do mm. um, when when you're thinking about bringing on board the uh, people with the right skills and expertise. I mean, it seems like it's a super competitive market for these kind of people. I mean, h- how do you go about finding them, bringing them on board? Uh, yeah, it's not easy. <laughs> uh, mm. I, think that's, I think that's definitely the case. 
You're right. I, I think also what's interesting is that it feels like if you rewind just a few years ago, there weren't as many people that were as interested in the broader domain as there are now. So I think that's helped because it means hmm. people are setting that out as a career trajectory that historically they weren't. So I think hmm. I, I'm, I'm certainly bullish on the, the, the size and quality of the talent pool over the next few years. Yeah, I mean, speaking of someone who runs a, a master's program and does admissions for it, our, our, our number of applicants <laughs> Got a good is, pipeline. <laughs> it, it grow, we have, yeah, we have, well, you know, five to ten times as many people wanting to do this master's program as we can handle. Um, wow. And new, a few new programs do start, although it's quite hard to start a new whole degree or educational program to train people for this field. But, the, but mm. it's growing in general. Absolutely. What's driving yeah. this? Is it just general AI? I think it's probably kind of a cool it is. Topic it, or? Uh, yeah, if, I think it's partially that. Um, there's always been a lot of people that have, you know, have a real, they're nerds about language. So they, they maybe they did a linguistics degree. They just want to love language, not just learning them, but like taking it to pieces and putting it back together again. And this is one place they really get to do linguistics like for real mm -hmm. in an engineering sense of doing, doing something both creative and technical with linguistic knowledge but they've got to get the technical skills you know they, they don't get those in the linguistics degree so mm -hmm. so to give them that and then to let them move forward um is that that's a, that's been a, a long-standing trend there yep um and equally all those ai degrees and computer science degrees out there you know these people don't all want to be software engineers that's not very interesting is it you know but they want to do something that's like a bit a bit cool or be in a company with interesting cool people doing doing mm -hmm. interesting cool things um and, and they're also kind of coming into language from the outside as it were so jesse to uh to make sure that you can hire these people and and, and pay them well and, and be competitive in the market you obviously need to to raise capital which you did uh a yeah. couple of times i think you started out within a um was it a grant but then you raised the first series like a what a seed seed round and now series a when was it in december like uh 11 million dollars uh around that can, can you just tell us a little more how did you connect with those investors why did you choose to work with exactly these uh, there's a few angels in there that that have uh, deep deep industry connections mm. and uh why why isn't bootstrapping ever an option at all in in, in something like as fast paced as, as you're in oh yeah bootstrapping is always enticing i think it also probably becomes more enticing for people after you've raised money and you realize that it would probably be nice not to have all of the all of the pressures and noise that comes along with fundraising yeah fundraising to me is 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 a means to an end and i think oftentimes there's too much fanfare and excitement around it um i, I think the reality of of working on in within deep learning in texas speech is that it's not simple it's not something simple that you code overnight and start selling tomorrow and i think it just does require that maturation period and it needs to be nurtured and you, you almost need to have that capacity of time to allow even researchers to just dwell in it and so that's one of the fundamental reasons why we raised capital because i knew like we knew we needed that mm. um and their investors so then what you then need to do is okay you need to think about who who cares about this sort of space and i think because probably Text to speech was more popularized commercially through things like Alexa and Google Home. More investors started thinking about different applications of text to speech. And that's why we have one of the top seed funds. Local Globe is one of our backers, as well as a few ventures on with media companies, including Sky and The Guardian and Bertelsmann as well. Um, we also have a US investor by the name of Sense Capital, which has been fantastic. Um, and then a bunch of angel investors, like you said. And angel investors are mainly people that want to stay close to the company that are really interested in its future, but that can also be quite helpful and constructive over its history. And so that's, we, we've tried creating a pretty diverse range of people that are close to the company. Uh, yeah. I mean, and do you have any uh, plans to do any future raises maybe this year, 2021 or is that it for now? Uh, thankfully we, we don't need to raise for a little while. So I'm hoping that uh, there are, you know, you always have, investors that are interested especially interestingly once you have announced a fundraise that's when you also see a flood of more inbound mm -hmm. requests um but thankfully we're okay for now uh, we also do we also do have um innovate uk projects which we're really proud of which is some of the government grants in the uk to fund uh really compelling research um and a bunch of other things that we've that we've looked into but it's primarily uh standard venture capital as well as the grants 
It's quite quite a frothy environment right now. I mean, there's a lot of money chasing after good ideas, I guess. There is. Uh, Florida, so. If this is your expression of interest to invest in paper cups next round, but we take the money with open <laughs> arms, it's very kind of you. <laughs> All right, let's talk off. Asking for a nice. friend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, great. So let's just close on the product vision. Next two to three, four years, uh, what's in the pipeline? What's what, what are the plans? What are the ambitions? To me, it's just, yeah, it comes down to quality of voices, breadth of languages, and just applications that you can go after. Again, it's, it's, such, an, it's such a wide territory for us to try and tackle. And I want us, uh, I want us pushing on all those verticals. And they're all tough in their own right because... Voice quality is different from languages. It's different from product. It's different from commercial application. And so focus will always be the name of the game. But I'm just excited to try and push into different territories as we can go. Got it. Got it. Very interesting. Well, Jesse Simon, it was uh, great to have you, have you on the pod. Thanks so much for taking the time. Of course. Thanks for having us. Thanks yep. very much. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye.